Hello, you're listening to Corpus Cast, the show all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. My name is Robbie Love, and I'm a lecturer in English language here at Aston University. I'm a corpus linguist, meaning that I study linguistic patterns, trends, and variations using large samples of language data. So, on behalf of the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group, welcome to the show. In each episode of Corpus Cast, I interview top researchers in the field to find out more about how corpus linguistics can be applied uh, in all sorts of contexts. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you'll see that we're back once again in the official Corpus Cast studio, uh, where occasionally in the series, I'll be lucky enough to meet our guests face to face. Um, I don't quite believe it, but we're actually celebrating the end of the first whole year of Corpus Cast. So if you've been with us since the beginning, uh, thank you for staying with us. And if you're just joining us now for today's episode, welcome. And we're certainly looking forward to seeing what 2023 brings. Now, in today's show, our topic is television dialogue. The language of fictional television series is encountered by millions of viewers worldwide on their TVs, uh, their computers, tablets, or phones. Uh, streaming services like Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Disney Plus, among many others nowadays, uh, have arguably become the main way in which many people watch TV shows. And our guest today is interested in what we can learn about the language of popular TV shows and how knowledge about the language of fictional TV characters can have applications that are anything but fictional. So our guest, Professor Monica Bednarik, is Professor of Linguistics and Director of the Sydney Corpus Lab at the University of Sydney, Australia. Monica's primary research interest is in corpus-based discourse analysis, focusing on English language media texts with uh, two main strands, language used in the news and language used, as I said, in fictional TV series. She's the author of several books, including News Discourse with Helen Capel, The Language of Fictional uh, Television and Language and Television Series. Now, when I emailed Monica to uh, invite her onto Corpus Cast, uh, I never imagined that we'd be able to do it sitting side by side, face to face, due to the great distance between the UK and Australia. But by a stroke of good fortune, at least for me, uh, Monica finds herself here in Birmingham at the moment. And so it's my great pleasure to welcome to Corpus Cast Professor Monica Bednarik. Hello, Monica. Thank you so much for doing this. And thank you for coming to Aston in person, which was very much unexpected, but uh, it's great to have you here. It's a great pleasure, Robbie, and thanks for having me on the on the podcast. So on the thank you. It, it's, it is really exciting, actually, because um, otherwise you are all the way over in, in Sydney and you have been for um, obviously over, over COVID and everything. And so it's, it's great that you're here um, visiting uh, the University of Birmingham at the moment and uh, working with corpus linguists there. Um, so why don't we start, I suppose, at the beginning. Uh, what does corpus linguistics mean to you? Well, that's a, it's a really good question. Um, you know, for me, corpus linguistics is a lot of things. So I would say, yes, on the one hand, it's just, uh, it's an approach or methodology, but I really think it's more than that. Um, you know, it, it gives us a set of um, theoretical principles, uh, analytical principles as well that we can use when we do our research. Um, it gives us, um, you know, the the evidence for the claims that we're making about language. Um, yeah, and, you know, one of the things that I think is particularly important is that we can look at the history of corpus linguistics now and we can see that certain theories about language have been developed within the approach or discipline or whatever you want to call it of mm. corpus linguistics. And I think it's really important not to forget those theoretical aspects as well. But at the same time, um, I think the methodological aspects are obviously also really important. The corpus linguistic techniques that we can use, um, the corpus design principles as well, in particular, I think sometimes, again, we forget about those, that there's a lot of, like, a big body of research that's been um, written about how do we design a corpus, uh, notions such as uh, what makes this data set representative of the language variety that we want to study. And so I think for me, it's, it's not just one thing, it's many things at the mm -hmm. same time. And also, I suppose, it's just a way um, into language. I, I really like some of the metaphors that people have used, um, or images, if you will, you know, whether you look at corpus linguistics as a, as a telescope or, <laughs> you know, what, whatever, kaleidoscope or whatever <laughs> it is. Um, but personally, I also like combining corpus linguistics with other approaches. 
just because I think there's no one approach that always gives us uh, like the full picture. Yeah. And, and how did you get into this, which, you know, in the grand scheme of things might be considered fairly niche <laughs> interest? Uh, how did it start for you? Take me back to the beginning of your career. I mean, I'd say probably, I mean, today maybe it's this niche, mm. but, but yeah, when I started, I did actually encounter corpus linguistics during my master's degree, which was, uh, which I undertook in Germany, but I didn't take um, a class in corpus linguistics mm. at that point, but I knew of it and there were classes um, offered on corpus linguistics at that time, um, which was sort of um, late 90s, early, early 2000s. Um, and then, but then I, I didn't really pursue that during my MA. I, I did, I focused more on pragmatics, discourse analysis, um, even cognitive linguistics. Um, then I decided to do a PhD in the area of uh, looking at the expression of opinion. Um, and as part of that, I spent um, some time, I think it was maybe eight months at the University of Birmingham working with Susan Hanston. Um, and during that time, I audited a lot of classes in corpus linguistics. And I, th I think, you know, that really got me into corpus linguistics, um, doing it, um, you know, using it, applying it. And I mean, I didn't, so the, the work that I was doing during my PhD still involved a lot of manual discourse analysis. It involved some corpus linguistic techniques as well, but it's really only in my second book, which is the um, Emotion Talk Across Corpora, which looks at um, how emotion is expressed in the English language that's when I really started getting into corpus linguistics. But that was really still based on that sort of training and encounter with corpus linguistics that I had while I was a visiting scholar at the University of Birmingham mm. um, during that time. And ever since then, I've just continued, you know, I think we, we continue to, to develop uh, as linguists throughout our careers, or at least I hope we do. You yeah, know, I, yeah. I would like to do that. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I still now experiment with mm. corpus linguistics and combining it with different theoretical approaches or other kinds of methods in linguistics as well. Um, and that's actually also one of the things that I love about corpus linguistics is there's, there's always something new that you can explore and a new direction that you can take. So, of course, we're going to dive into uh, one of the, the, the sort of big strands of your research, looking at uh, television dialogue. But we fast forward from, from those early days and look at the present day. You're now the director of Sydney Corpus Lab. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about the, the initiative behind that and, and the, the overall kind of direction that that, that centre is, is moving in. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so the lab is really about promoting corpus linguistics in Australia. Um, and I, I really like that aspect of it, um, that it is about community building. It's about building capacity in corpus linguistics, specifically in Australia, but of course, you know, always with a view to international collaboration as well. So what we do is we uh, we try to um, do some events. Um, of course, it was a little bit disrupted by COVID, yeah. as you can imagine, yeah. but uh, we started out with a bang. I, I, we started with a bang, I think in 2019, we had a symposium to, to launch, the, uh, launch the lab. Um, and we still now we've we've started doing a few more events now um, that it's become a little bit less um, stressful, I should say. Um, so we've got events on the one hand that includes sort of more training events like workshops, but uh, we also have guest lectures by um, academics, um, most most often with a focus on Australia, um, Australian English, at, at, for example, but not just also other aspects of Australian um, uh, languages. Um, so we have these events. Um, we also have um, sometimes other types of training that we, we offer that might be online. Uh, I have a blog post series that um, I'm sort of initiated to showcase the work of people who do corpus linguistics in Australia. And sometimes um, it's my students, sometimes it's other people's students, sometimes it's researchers at other universities, just to um, give people a little bit of a glimpse of the corpus linguistics that is going on in Australia, but also yeah, to, to build this community, to give people um, a uh, more informal outlet to write about what they're doing. Um, and I found that I, I myself have learned a lot through that as well. And I'm still trying to think of you know what, what will be the most useful in terms of these these blog posts um, to feature, and so I've um, um, got a few ideas for next year. We'll see. We'll see um, what's what's going to happen. Um, we also do um, research capacity building through um, a project that is funded by the what's called the Australian Research Data Commons, and that is, involves more um, the use of text analytics 
um, as a co more uh, computational tools for analyzing data set. But it's particularly interesting there to think about the connection to corpus linguistics and how is it, for example, a text analytics approach, um, but also how can you use corpus linguistics to, um, to get people in, in this mindset in terms of thinking about, what, well, what kinds of questions can you actually ask mm. when you start using computer-based methods to look at language? I think that's a, always a really good um, way into this sort of thinking. Um, well, the other thing that I have is a mailing list, um, which again, you know, is really all about community building and we use it to um, publicize events, not necessarily just in Australia, but just events that might be of interest to Australian corpus linguists. Um, so that might include um, also conferences overseas mm -hmm. um, uh, and so on. And then, of course, we try to support researchers in Australia if they have particular questions or we just try to support um, Australian linguistics also by just doing particular projects on aspects to do with um, Australian Englishes, for example, or um, other kinds of um, questions that people ask in other disciplines. So it just, um, it just depends. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, basically, the goal is to really offer a nice community for corpus linguists in Australia to encourage uh, the research, but not necessarily at the expense of other types of uh, research. Um, so it's very, very open and flexible, and um, hopefully people will find it of interest. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, there's an awful lot of activity that you've got going on there and, and so many different strands to the work of your lab and also your own uh, research uh, pathway, I suppose. News language is a whole other thing, and I wish we could talk about that as well, and maybe one day we will. Um, but we're going to focus on, on TV shows now, and of course, that's something that uh, probably uh, an awful lot of people are very familiar with, but um, maybe not really thinking about it from a linguistic perspective. So what, what drew you into applying linguistic methods, and specifically corpus linguistic methods, to the language of TV shows? So, I mean, why using corpus linguistics methods? I, I, I mean, that's the easier question to answer mm -hmm. because that's sort of at this point, you know, yeah. at, I had this interest in corpus linguistics and corpus-based discourse analysis and obviously interest in the kinds of insights that you can gain through that method. But um, yeah, what made me interested in uh, television dialogue in the first place, I mean, I think it goes back quite a, quite a while. I mean, so I grew up in, in Germany um, and as a, as a teenager, I still remember one of the very few ways in which I could encounter English language was actually through television. I mean, at that point, it was quite rare. I mean, we mm -hmm. didn't have, there was no streaming, there was no internet. <laughs> 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 we, we had, we had some, some shows that we could get in English through um, satellite TV or other, other ways. Uh, but so I managed to encounter spoken English through this medium mm. of television dialogue. And that that is sort of, I guess, an experience that has always stayed with me um, as a language learner myself. Mm. What um, was your favorite show growing up? Oh, I had a lot of favorite <laughs> shows, but uh, well, Star Trek Next Generation. Okay. I shall say that's <laughs> one way in which I encountered, through which I actually encountered Shakespeare, because oh. if you are uh, familiar with the show, you know that Jean-Luc Picard, the captain, um, often cites um, Shakespeare, so I remember I remember that quite mm -hmm. distinctly. But yeah, there there were many other shows. It's probably too embarrassing to <laughs> to, to mention them. Um, so so that's sort of more of a personal, um, I guess, a personal experience as mm -hmm. as a learner. Even even though my work on television dialogue doesn't so much focus on language learning and teaching, but it is just this general idea of uh, here's a source of language that is a lot of people are exposed to all around the world, especially if you look at the kinds of series that come from the United States that are exported, syndicated everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and even for, you know, not necessarily for learners of English, also for other speakers of other language varieties, for example. Um, and, you know, they will encounter this sort of language um, in, um, you know, to... Um, to a larger extent that they might encounter um, someone speaking in a casual conversation. So I was always interested in the fact that, so we have this, this is this is a fact, but at the same time, at that point when I started um, out with this research, there was very, very little lingu linguistic description of this type of language. So sort of, you know, here's this linguistic phenomenon and we are not analyzing it. We don't have enough knowledge about it. And so for me, that was something that we really need to address. Um, there are also other, you know, a lot of other reasons. 
so, you know, I think television dialogue is also really important for other reasons. So issues of social representation, that we look at how our language variety is represented in television mm -hmm. series and what does that tell us about the language attitudes and also ideologies that people have. Um, you know, so there's, there's, there's a lot of... Um, uh, there are lot of, there's a lot of richness to the data, I should say, and I just feel like this means that we should analyze it, we should be able to describe it just so that we get a better understanding. It's also constantly in flux, so you can see how there's this dialectic relationship, um, sort of reciprocal relationship between language and society, um, one reflecting the other, and that's interesting as well. Mm. So, yeah, so those, I guess, are some of the reasons. I've always been interested in popular culture and why, you know, some people have perhaps shied away from analyzing it because maybe they saw a danger of you know being tainted by the the popular brush yeah. but i i've <laughs> always felt that that's not a good reason mm. to, to to not analyze it so you've uh, you've developed this this corpus the the sydney corpus of television dialogues or sid tv yeah. i think is a great name <laughs> um tell us a bit about how you how you built this and 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 what it represents and what you have already done with it perhaps or, or what you hope people might do with it now that it's uh, available for people to use? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I developed the corpus because at that point there wasn't really a corpus that I um, could use, mm. uh, particularly a corpus that would have fulfilled the variables that I wanted it to fulfill. Um, so I, um, it's a corpus that is representative of US American TV series. So it doesn't have any British data mm -hmm. in it, for example. Um, and that was a decision that I made at that point when I started out, because as I mentioned earlier, a lot of um, series I exported from, from the US and um, that was one of my interests in that as well. Uh, uh, just the sheer amount of US television dialogue that gets exported. Um, I wanted to have a corpus that is not just representative of one or a few shows, but something that is representative of say let's call it recent now mm -hmm. and I, I don't i wouldn't say it's contemporary mm -hmm. it's sort of recent television dialogue and across um television series that are targeted adults so not not kids um across sort of drama and comedy genres so um not just one genre but different kinds of genres um and particularly also one thing that was interesting and which, which is probably um a sort of relatively special feature of the corpus is that because television series are serial narratives, you also need to consider uh, the text, what we might call textual time. So, you know, where you have a, a first episode, mm -hmm. you have episodes in the middle, you have the final episode and different, you know, there's different narrative progression often. I mean, it depends on the type of genre that you're looking at. But um, in the cases where you have a serial narrative that can be interesting and pilot or the first episode in particular often has particular functions. So what I also wanted to make sure was that you have a, a mix of different types of episodes represented in the corpus mm. from really the first episodes, last episodes, early episodes, episodes in the middle. So that made it a bit more complicated. And the other thing, I think the other major factor was that I wanted to look at so-called quality television as well as so-called mainstream television. Um, and so I had to think about how to operationalize that. In the end, I did it through sort of awards, um, looking at shows that had either been nominated for a particular kinds of television awards or had won the awards. And, and so after I'd considered all of these variables, I basically tried to um, compile a corpus that was relatively balanced with respect to all of these variables. Um, the other thing is that um, it includes cable and um, and sort of more network broadcast television, which is important um, for a variety of reasons because they're governed by different kinds of rules and regulations, which, which can then impact on language. Um, however, so I said earlier, it's not really representative of contemporary television because, for example, there are, there are actually no um, shows that were originally created for streaming services. Mm. That is because, you know, it's taken quite a while to build the corpus. Yeah, it's it's time consuming yeah, because yeah. a lot of the episodes were basically transcribed from scratch. So it has some um, dialogue from 66 different series and um, 66 different episodes from the first season each. Ah. So it's not the scripts. No, it's no. transcripts yes. of the yes. the output, yes. the actual yeah. end yeah. product. Yes. Okay. So I was okay. always interested in, even though you know, I think scripts or you know, screenplays or whatever you want to mm. call them are interesting products in their own right. But I was always interested in the in the language that the audience encounters yeah. as they are watching the characters, you know, yeah. on television in the narrative, mm. um, rather than the um, the screen directions and you know 
that um, that the screenwriters yeah. are, are writing. So, so did you transcribe them all yourself? <laughs> no, I, was, I, I was very lucky that I had some funding. Okay. Uh, so I, I, over it's the years, uh, I mean, it, that's another reason why it took a while. You mm. know, I had little pots of um, mm. funding over mm. time and so built it up over time. Um, but that was, yeah, that was very lucky. And so, uh, yeah, I had a few research assistants over the, over the years who helped mm. me transcribe the data. Um, and of course, you know, the, the transcription isn't, um, you know, the type of detailed transcription that, for example, you might undertake in conversation analysis. So you always mm. have to have a think about the trade off between the detail of the linguistic transcription and the amount of data and funding that you have. I mean, I don't need to tell you this. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you probably know that. Uh, all, all, all too aware all too for aware. my sins. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's, you know, you've, you've got the data and, you know, I'm imagining you sitting down one day, right, I'm going to start looking at it now. What is the, it, I mean, I suppose I should add, is there, uh, I suppose, a, a defining set of linguistic features that you've been able to identify go ah that's that's the stuff that makes it distinctively you know tv dialogue characters on a tv show talking is what are the sort of features that stand out as opposed yeah. to other yeah. genres of speech so to speak yeah yeah now that's a good question i mean um the first thing that i i mean i prior to working with this corpus i mm. had actually worked on television dialogue but mm. with respect to uh more specific narratives so when I then had this corpus that is more representative of this language variety, that was one of the first things that I did do that I wanted to see, okay, let's look at the previous studies that have already identified some features, but mostly they did it on the basis of looking at particular series. And we might not necessarily be able to generalize from that right? because the results could just be limited to this yeah. particular show, this particular narrative, these particular characters or this particular genre. So um, I did look at, I used corpus linguistic methods, of course, um, and mostly starting by looking at sort of keywords. Um, so words that are unusually frequent in TV dialogue compared to unscripted conversation. Uh, but I also looked at it from a more sort of functional perspective, I suppose. So I guess, um, you know, it's hard to come up with one defining feature. There's a, there's a range of things that television dialogue does that is different to mm -hmm. um, what happens when we speak in unscripted conversation. But um, one of the one of the major issues, uh, not issues, one of the major functions is obviously to entertain the audience, and so we will have um, emotionality, expressivity, entertainment as uh, quite important. So the dialogue often functions in these particular ways. Mm. Um, to that, there could be positive emotion, it could be um, you know humor, it could be conflict, it can be drama, and so we have a lot of words. Um, in um, television dialogue that includes swearing, for example, but it also includes, um, you know, adjectives. It includes other types of um, emotional resources, and they tend to be quite highly frequent in this data, um, showing us um, the emotionality of the characters and therefore drawing the audience into the into the whole plot and into the, the characters themselves, allowing us to identify with them, to feel with them. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing that you can see is that television dialogue tends to be fairly comprehensible and intelligible. Mm. So there's a tendency towards more what we might call uh, language varieties that the audience is more familiar with. Um, but at the, the same time, you also see if language varieties are represented that are maybe less familiar, then they tend to be more stereotypical and more exaggerated, again, with the aim of maybe making sure the audience recognizes who these characters are supposed to be mm. uh, or with the intention of creating humor or other kinds of um, uh, effects. Um, we also see that that we can also see that in terms of how people pronounce their words, you know, that's quite different as well. Mm. Um, and a tendency towards, um, shall we say, coherence or fluency. So there, it, there's not an absence of these features. I mean, we do find some of the features that we find in ordinary conversation, like hesitation, interruptions, that mm. sort of thing, but they tend to be less, uh, less frequent. Uh, one of the things that I should point out is, of course, you know, these are all tendencies or trends and not all TV shows will be the same. Yeah. There, there are, you know, there are innovative shows that try to use language in a more realistic way. There are, you know, there are shows that try to represent particular language varieties more accurately. So it's also interesting to, to see how that's going to develop. Um, 
it also depends on what kind of genre you're looking at, mm. you know, drama or comedy. So there'll be differences between uh, types of dialogue depending on the genre, depending on the actual narrative itself. Like, who are these characters actually? Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, the characters also use language in a way that reflects their kind of characteristics, whether that's sort of personality characteristics or other kind of social characteristics. Mm. Um, and so, you know, we can make certain generalizations, but they are really generalizations and they are trends. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you will always find these features in every particular show that you're mm. analyzing. You, you mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, you know, your own story uh, anecdotally of uh, learning English through, in a way, <laughs> seeing especially these American TV shows. And and I know in your work, you you know, you've identified that this is a a very sort of common story for many people who are, are, are learning English as a as a as a foreign language. Um, you mentioned there about the the fluency and the clarity and the fact that it is you know largely scripted, right? Mm -hmm. So it's pre-prepared um, and it's delivered with clarity. In terms of potentially the the sort of application or one one possible application of this sort of research, is this something that you know is is helpful in a way for learners who compared to observing uh, L1 speakers talking naturally, which will have all of these casual conversational features of so-called disfluencies, um, is seeing, you know, people talking in, in a way that is perhaps more, um, perhaps easier to, to process. That's surely that must be helpful or is there a trade off with the, the fact that it's less natural, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be honest, it's not really exactly my area of research, mm -hmm. but there is a lot of um, research that looks exactly at that. They, they look at, um, you know, what's the use of TV shows, for example, for people acquiring uh, words, mm -hmm. vocab mm -hmm. acquisition. Um, there are, there's research that looks at, for example, one of the advantages, another advantage of a TV series would be that you can turn on subtitles, right? Mm -hmm. So you can either have same language subtitles or you can have the subtitles in your first language. And so there are certain advantages that other advantages as well, in addition to the sort of comprehensibility that the TV shows do offer. Also accessibility, of course. I mean, we can immerse ourselves into the language of another country by going there, but we might not always have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So the easy accessibility, especially now, um, I mean, these days is, is better than, than when I was um, a teenager. That's certainly also an advantage. Um, so, you know, I mean, if you're using it, there's also a difference in terms of whether you're using it on your own just by watching television yeah. or whether you're using it in a guided um, program yeah. at, at school yeah. where, you know, I think the, the teacher can, um, can maybe also make it more effective. Um, but yeah, so in terms of the actual sort of research experiments, mm. I'm not sure just mm. because it's not totally yeah, the yeah, area that sure, I've worked yeah. in. You, you also mentioned swearing, um, <laughs> and that's something that I've done a little bit of work on uh, in my own research, but naturally anyway, it's just something that's always quite fun to, to think about. Um, <laughs> what have you found about how TV characters swear and, and, and is this changing over time, I suppose, in the context of changes in maybe are there certain words that were not so acceptable earlier, which are now. Tell us a bit about what you've what you've looked at with swearing. Yeah. So first of all, uh, remember that I'm looking at American uh, uh -huh. television, yeah. so I wouldn't necessarily know about, as we know, there are certain yeah. sailors that are more British yeah, um, yeah. than American. Um, I haven't done the diachronic research because my corpus is a you know contemporary mm. um, corpus, so it, you know doesn't look at change over time. But other people have certainly looked at it, um, and they have found, which you know is probably not going to surprise you, but they mm. found that uh, sort of milder swear words have become uh, more acceptable uh, over time, and so they've lost some of their taboo nature that they might have had in the past, and that's one development. But then at the same time, if you do look at at television corpora or television subtitle corpora, you will also find that the frequency of stronger swear words has increased. But the reason is um, because we've had these huge changes in the television industry. So we, oh. you know, as I mentioned, in the context of the US, uh, there are certain actually rules and regulations um, around the use of swearing. And but those rules um, apply differently to whether you're looking at network television or cable and streamers. Ah, okay. And so the rise of um, cable and streaming services has meant that there are more shows that are not censored. So mm. therefore, we have more of these um, 
words in a corpus if you if you just look at it from the point of corpus composition mm. and that's that's an influence there as well in terms of the research that i've done myself mm -hmm. um well this is exactly one of the distinctions that are, differences that i found so you know if you want to say okay what's the most frequent word um it actually really depends on whether you're looking at censored television or uncensored television yeah okay um yeah. it also depends you know what you define as a swear word mm -hmm. i mean would you include for example words well, interjection uses of God, would, would you say, oh, my God, is a swear mm. word? If we do include it, then that's actually the most frequent. So, <laughs> okay, right. Um, yeah. Oh, God, oh, my God, my God, you know, all of these uses of God as interjection, they are very frequent across different programs. Also, they occur both in censored uh, series as well as in uncensored series. Um, also, other sort of milder swear words like hell, for example, mm -hmm. it also occurs. It often occurs in particular structures like what the hell, yeah. why the hell, you know, who the hell. Yeah. So these particular um, linguistic structures you can you can observe. Um, then if you look at the strongest swear words, they're they're not still not allowed to occur in network and broadcast television. So that there will be zero occurrences. So the extent to which you as a viewer would encounter these particular swear words really does depend on what you're consuming. Mm. Um, and even within the sort of uncensored television shows, you will say, see variation. I mean, I, I think if people who watch a lot of television will, will intuitively know this <laughs> yeah. because they know, okay, yeah, in this show they swear all the time, whereas yeah. in this show it's also from the same, maybe from the same production company, but there's much less use of swearing because it really depends. I mean, swearing isn't really gratuitous. I mean, that's one of the things that I've looked at as well. What are the functions of swearing? Mm. And, you know, a, a lot of the time it, it fulfills particular functions for the narrative. I mean, it well, one, one function is just to tell us about like the emotion that the character is feeling at this, this point in time. But it can also tell us something about, say, their age. It can tell us some, you know, it, it can be used to, to construct their personality. Mm. Even, even characters who don't use swear words, you know, who use, for example, euphemism, like gosh or something, yeah. instead of the swear word, even that then has a function of telling us something about this character. This yeah. is a character who would not use swear words. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I, that's another thing that I found really interesting to analyze as well. Okay, you know, rather than just looking, say, at the frequency and the variation, uh, what are they used for? And they're really quite multifunctional. And I, I suggest that that's maybe one reason why they are relatively frequent mm. is because they are so multifunctional. They can, uh, you know, they can also bring in the audience um, as well. Um, but of course, you know, they, they do have the potential to offend some people. Um, but yes, it, that also totally depends on the type of swear words that, that is included. And mm. um, I mean, these days, slur words are probably more offensive to most people than, than technical swear words. I'd yeah, say. yeah. And, and I wonder if there's a, um, an effect of, of genre, right? Say a crime thriller as opposed to a comedy series. And I suppose maybe frequency potentially isn't affected in terms of the ranking of the most popular, but perhaps from a functional perspective, as you say, um, I wonder if that, have you, have you looked at that or? I haven't looked at genre variation mm. um, as far as I remember. Mm. I can't remember right now, <laughs> but I've definitely looked at, you know, even if you look at particular words, you'll, you'll find that some words have quite a lot of variation mm. um, across particular shows just in terms of, um, you know, outlier, that you will find outliers because some of the characters, and, and those outliers might be there just because of particular characters, particular sweary characters. Um, but yeah, I mean, it does it does really also depend on the narrative world. Mm. You know, who are the characters in this narrative world? Yeah, yeah. And are they the sort of characters or speakers that we would expect to swear in real life mm. as well? So, you know, what is the narrative world? Is it a professional world? You know, if it's a yes, professional yes. world, you know, you maybe, well, it depends on the kind of profession, obviously, but, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a, a, a narrative world centering around a profession where you wouldn't expect swear words to be used because there may be formal context, then, of course, you'll find less uh, swear words there, um, you know. And, well, that's just one example um, of how that... So it interacts with a lot of factors. It might interact with genre, but mm -hmm. it also interacts with the, the narrative world and interacts particularly with whether it's a censored um, program um, or an uncensored um, program. Mm. I, I want to um, sort of ask you to to take a stance on on an issue that I, I've been thinking about, which is, you know, looking at corpora of fictional uh, TV dialogue or, or film scripts or you know subtitled or the actual output. Um, you know, there, there are some who who uh, sort of encourage the use of of these often 
can be quite large data sets if you get lots and lots and lots of scripts and put them together, almost as a, as a proxy for casual, you know, naturally occurring casual conversation. Um, then there might be other people who, who would sort of say, well, hang on a minute, it, is it the same? You know, do, would, should we consider um, scripted fictional conversation to be um, accepted as, as a, a window with, through which to research natural language? So I, I, I sort of wonder wh which side of the fence you, you, you sit with this, because I, I find it quite interesting that sometimes you, you do see some people um, making claims about sort of natural conversation based on data that is, you know, essentially scripted fictional language. And are the similarities enough to kind of make that claim of them being part of the same genre or register of language? I wonder what you think about this. I mean, I'm not too much a fan of just the words authentic and natural. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer probably scripted and unscripted yeah, because you yeah. can see, you know, there are scripted um, versions of language that occur in more in non-media context, uh -huh. but also in other media contexts. But going back to the question, um, I mean, for me, television dialogue is, you know, a particular language variety. I've That's one of the things that I've done in my research yeah. that I've tried to say, okay, what is this language variety? What are the features of this specific language variety? Mm. And, you know, there's a scripted language variety. Um, if you look at the kinds of features that it does have, you know, of course, there are some similarities with unscripted language. So especially if you look, and, and that other research has shown this. So, you know, especially if you look at Lex's, um, some grammatical structures as yeah, well, yeah. you'll find similarities, you know, but it's a selective imitation. It's a partial imitation. Um, you also need to consider the differences. But I also think that it's not, you know, we don't need to just look at television dialogue because it can, it's a proxy or something for, for you know, unscripted language. Mm. Well, I think it's precisely interesting to analyze television dialogue because it is an example of media language yeah. and we should be looking at, at it as an example of media language. And that can give us really rich insights as well. I mean, yes, we should, you know, we should, um, it's, it's a good idea to look at its features and it's probably also a good idea to compare it to unscripted conversation to figure out, okay, what exactly are the similarities? What are the differences? Where can television dialogue perhaps be useful, for example, in language learning and teaching? Um, you know, to to help learners to understand how unscripted conversation might work. But at the same time, we also do need to be aware of the differences, um, you know, whether that's in relation to turn taking or um, other kinds of things. I mean, it really depends also if you look at the studies, um, some of the studies that find similarities, you know, they they don't necessarily look at all features of language. So it really, I guess we have to be just uh, careful in terms of the claims that we make. Um, but yeah, for me, it is a particular kind of language variety um, and interesting to look at for those reasons. Um, and we need to consider, you know, the functions, um, the media context. Mm. I mean, that's all part of uh, what we might, some, some people call media linguistics, right? Is that you're doing media linguistics when you actually consider the aspects of the media as well, not just uh, the language, you know, they're, mm. they're the two aspects to it. So that's, that's, I guess, my own stance is that I prefer to look at it as an example of a particular language variety. Mm. But, you know, I still think it's, that doesn't mean that we can deny that there are certain similarities. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Mm. but it is, uh, yeah, it is a way of, I mean, I'm hoping other people will use the data to do research that, um, you know, I, I haven't done. Um, I'm at, at the moment, um, I've moved using Corpus Linguistics more to look at Australian data. So I'm um, I'm not currently not using the Sid TV corpus mm -hmm. um, for my own research, and that's another reason why I hope that other people are going to continue to use it because it was very time consuming to construct it. And yeah, it was carefully constructed, <laughs> yeah. and I just yeah I really do hope that others can use it. It doesn't have to be in research; it could also be in their teaching. Um, you know, it could be students who use it. Um, yeah, and any any kind of. Um, pedagogic users would also be useful. I mean, for example, if people want to, I think, you know, teach about critical literacy, yeah. even in relation to things like swearing um, and how that might be used or uh, the representation of particular kinds of language varieties. So I think there's lots and lots of different applications mm. um, in teaching as well as in research, hopefully. And, and presumably from a sort of critical discourse perspective, not only re representation of varieties, but representation of 
social groups and, and yeah. societal structures yeah. And, yeah. and things like that that yes. must be yeah. a lot that yeah. would be revealed through looking at yeah. that data i mean it depends you know obviously um it's that's limited by the transcription detail yeah. but yeah. i mean that's another reason why the transcription isn't necessarily super detailed i always thought that people could use it as a starting point and then do their own follow-up transcription mm. as well that is more detailed and focuses on specific aspects so you could use the corpus to find particular instances and then you could use you know go to the data yourself and do yeah. more detailed transcription i have looked a little bit at this in relation to stigmatized language so particularly looking at the word ain't mm. and looking at you know who are the kinds of characters that use ain't because that's uh, it's quite stigmatized and especially in the u.s context um, and so there's uh, many more applications, I think, um, similar to that, or also others. Um, but also people hopefully will be encouraged to maybe create their own corpora um, that allow them to answer their own research questions, because that corpus, like, you know, a lot, you can't answer all research yeah. questions, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping that it'll be useful anyway. So I want to sort of move on a little bit to potentially a, a, an area of application, although mm -hmm. I don't know, so I'm asking, <laughs> that's why I'm asking you, because you, you as I mentioned, you, you've published many books throughout your career, but there's one that to me stands out a little bit from the others. It's really a, a, a series of interviews that you conducted um, in the book, Creating Dialogue for TV, Screenwriters Talk Television. And you interviewed, I think, five um, Hollywood screenwriters who'd worked on some really, really big and well-known shows um, about how they write, the, how do they actually write for, for TV. So. I suppose, first of all, <laughs> how did you persuade these these sort of high flying Hollywood uh, script writers to spend time talking to a linguist? And <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, so I mean, I I was um, visiting the United States when I did these interviews, mm -hmm. so that that was helpful to start with. Um, so this is part of my bigger project to look at television dialogue from different perspectives. So not just looking at the television dialogue as we encountered, but also looking at how is this dialogue actually created and then also how it is consumed. And so how do it, how, yeah, I, I always <laughs> wanted to have interviewed yeah. with Korean, but I didn't know if I was going to achieve it. Mm. Um, my, I guess I actually, what I knew was that there was a screenwriter, um, Jane Espenson, who herself had a linguistics background. Ah, um, okay. And so I actually just um, tweeted her oh, okay. and um, <laughs> sort of just said, look, you know, um, I basically explained who I was and whether we could continue the conversation off Twitter. So mm. it, by email and, you know, she was very kindly caught in touch. And then we had some conversation uh, by email about, you know, the ethics application and things like that in the project itself. Mm. And I started started with a, a long interview with her in, in LA, which uh, was fantastic. And, you know, because of her linguistics background, um, she was clearly interested in talking about it. And she had a, a you know, really interesting insights as well. And then I um, asked her who she recommended um, I talk to. And so obviously she had much more insights in that community in terms of which screenwriters or scriptwriters, mm -hmm. whatever term you might want to use, um, might be willing, interested in talking to me. And so I then um, p proceeded to contact the people that she suggested and some of them, you know, said, no, and some of them said yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I did some of the interviews in person. Um, so, for example, um, you know, I went to Warner Brothers <laughs> oh, wow. um, to the screenwriter's office to interview them. And some I ended up still doing via, via Zoom mm. um, rather than uh, face to face, just because of uh, where I was located in relation to LA and um, other kinds of um, concerns. But they were all, you know, very um, happy to have this conversation. I, I mean, a lot of the time, I think the interest that they get from the general public might be, well, the interest might be in the in the actors. You know, the actors are the mm. the ones that um, people might fawn uh, fawn about. So it's probably also an opportunity for them to talk about their craft um, that you know they some at least relish. And yeah, I'm very grateful to the screenwriters um, that have talked to me. Um, they were all really. Um, friendly and mm. um you know i'm so grateful that they gave their time to the project it must have been fascinating to yes, to get yeah. the chance to really pick their brains about yeah. their their process yes. and i suppose i'm curious about how receptive they they were you know that nowadays of course applied corpus linguistics is is a real uh a really big area and and that would seem to be finding more and more ways of taking insights from corpus research and 
uh, using them to inform mm. an area of, of uh, communication related practice. So do you see that as a, a similar sort of route uh, in terms of could the work that, that you and others have done analyzing um, the TV dialogue somehow inform what they do? And I don't want to say improve because obviously these are, you know, these are mm. very talented people who mm. clearly have a track record of producing really successful TV shows. So I'm not sure if improve is, is the right word, but is there, a, is there a way in there to somehow contribute, do you think? So what I, um, what I actually did is I took the insights that um, were gained from the linguistics research, uh -huh. corpus linguistics research, as well as some of the insights um, from the screenwriters, and I actually developed a screenwriting tip sheet. Um, and I then distributed through the Screenwriting Research Network, which is a network that includes people doing research and screenwriting, but also practitioners who teach screenwriting. So this is more about teaching um, mm. novices okay. who are not necessarily yet established screenwriters. And so that's where I would see one of the applications. And it has been uh, has been viewed, you know, mm. almost 2,000 times. So, I mean, there seems to be at least an interest because I also didn't find, uh, you know, there are screenwriting handbooks, but I didn't find much of a linguistic um, perspective in these handbooks. And so, you know, I thought, well, I'll, I'll give this a go and I'll just do a little bit of a, you know, screenwriting tip sheet based based on these insights. And yeah, you know, I I, I think it's being used. I think yeah. it's being used in teaching um, because I've had some positive feedbacks from people saying, oh, yes, great. This will be great for my teaching this semester. Mm -hmm. I haven't done a systematic, you know, evaluation of impact mm -hmm. or anything mm -hmm. like that. But I definitely see that as one um application, so screenwriting pedagogy in, the, in that sense. Um, more generally in terms of application, I also think in, it has applications for the curriculum and in other disciplines. So even actually in linguistics, I think, um, for example, stylistics obviously is one area where, you know, we, we might also look at things like characterization, not just in literary texts, but also in, in television narratives or drama. Uh, also social linguistics, because you can look at um, these issues that I mentioned earlier, like social representation, language ideologies, um, again, in that particular mediated context. Mm. Um, so that, I think, has a role for the curriculum, but also um, in the English language classroom with, you know, limitations in terms of how that is presented. And people have used it even in general introductions to linguistics, um, as there, there's actually... Um, quite a few examples of that around. So so those are some practical applications, particularly, I guess, that I've thought about in relation to the curriculum. Um, I don't know if, um, I don't know if established screenwriters um, would find um, in the insights useful or not. I think mm. it probably depends on the established screenwriter um, and their view on, on this kind of work. Um, I think one of the things that would they would possibly find interesting is just some of the findings around, say, frequency that, you know, they might not necessarily know and then that can be helpful. Um, I mean, also in relation to the work that you mentioned earlier on news, news discourse, you know, it's, mm. always, it, it's always good to know what is frequent, whether you want to imitate that or whether you want to avoid it. Mm. Then. So, you know, yeah. but having that yeah. information, I think, would be useful um, just in general. I mean, things like... Some of it also coincides with actually advice that is given in screenwriting handbooks, uh, things like around the use of names. Um, and yeah, so I think linguistics can provide particular mm. insights that maybe other kinds of perspectives on screenwriting uh, can't. Have, have you ever, this might be a bit of a weird question, have you ever had a go at writing something yourself? Or? No. <laughs> actually, actually. This ah, is wrong. OK, uh, here's very a story. Yeah. Very embarrassing fact, <laughs> when I was younger, I mm -hmm. won't say how, okay. how, how, how young or how old, I, I did do, uh, I did once write a fan fiction ah. episode of The X-Files. Ah. <laughs> so that was my Brilliant. one and only attempt. Um, so you can uh, email it to Gillian Anderson <laughs> and yeah. see what she thinks of it, right? I don't think it exists anymore <laughs> anywhere in either digital or uh, print Oh, form. that's a shame, but probably for the best for your probably sake, right? Probably for the best, yes, definitely. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Okay, we're going to um, start to wrap things up here. And uh, those who have been following us for um, a few uh, episodes already will know that we like to finish with some quick questions about corpus linguistics. So now it's Monica's turn in the hot seat. Um, there's three of them, okay? Um, quick questions, and we'll see how quick the answers are, all right? So uh, the first one is, what is the biggest change that you've noticed in corpus linguistics 
uh, since the beginning of your career? I'd say just the incredible growth and to, you know, together with that growth, like diversification into all the different areas of linguistics. Um, for me, that's the biggest change. I know there are other kind of mm. qualitative changes, but for me, that's the one that I would pick. Brilliant. Number two, what is the biggest misconception of corpus linguistics that you've encountered? Um, well, a few years ago, I was in a meeting and someone referred to corpus linguistics as, oh, isn't that just Google engrams? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I guess for me, that would be the conception that, um, you know, you don't have to have a very specific kind of training and theoretical and methodological know-how to do corpus linguistics. Mm. And also that it is just about counting or quantitative information where it does also include qualitative analysis. So, yeah. Mm. That's a, uh, I'm finding quite a common, uh, common response to that question. Finally, and hopefully to end on, on a, a rather, I suppose, a, an optimistic note, uh, how do you see corpus linguistics um, continuing, I suppose, to, to make an impact on the world in the future? Yeah, so, you know, I think it actually really depends on how corpus linguistics is going to develop. So, you know, uh, the world is such a big term, right? So, yeah, a bit dramatic, maybe. I apologize. <laughs> is, is corpus, <laughs> well, you know, it, it, I think it just depends um, what languages is corpus linguistics going to be impacting. You know, mm. that's going to have an impact on how, how corpus linguistics is going to develop the world. Um, are there, you know, what other disciplines are corpus linguists going to collaborate with? Other disciplines are going to be open to corpus linguistics. That's going to impact, I think, on mm. um, on the impact as well. And, you know, the kinds of collaborations that corpus linguists have and also, I think, the in institutional support for it. Um, so I, 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 I don't like to make kind of bold predictions uh -huh. for the future, but I, I mean, I, I think it will continue to have an impact um, on the world and hopefully a positive one. Um, and I, but I think we should just continue to, to reflect on, you know, where else can we go? What else, you know, what, what directions should we continue to pursue, but also what are the new directions that we should pursue as well? I like that. A suitably non-committal, but <laughs> positive and optimistic response. Um, okay, well, that does bring us to the end of this episode of Corpus Cast and the final episode of 2022. Um, so thank you for joining us. However you have accessed us, whether that's on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podcast Addict or Podchaser, uh, please do let us know your thoughts about this and all the other episodes of uh, Corpus Cast using the hashtag Corpus Cast. And make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter at Aston Corpus. Uh, Corpus Cast is an Aston Originals podcast written and hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by Sam Cook. So thank you uh, again for listening. And of course, the biggest thanks goes to today's guest, Monica Bednarik from the University of Sydney. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Robbie.